Well, welcome. Good to see you. Good morning. Glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, we are glad that you're joining us and our church here, wherever you're at. So glad to have you. Well, we looked last week at the value of being part of a small group. Today, we're going to be talking about the value of being part of a church. Some of you, uh, you know, you're here, you're deciding, you're kind of figuring out, hey, you know, is this the right church for me? Uh, how do I find a church? We're going to talk about that. Also, you know, even if this is your church, you have a church home, uh, I think it's worthy of, you know, paying attention, writing down what we're going to talk about. Because, you know, as we go through different seasons of life, and there may be a time you get moved or something happens where you're, you're needing to look for a church. You'll, how, how do you decide what church is best? Just whatever feels good? Well, that's part of it, but there should be a grid that you have in your mind. So we're going to talk about that. So you definitely want to dial in. Look at what the Bible says there. It says, you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and belong in God's household with every other Christian. So part of being a Christian means you're part of a family. It means that you belong. That's why I highlighted this. There's, you're a member. Uh, you're a family. You belong. These, in other words, the, to be uh, in the church is not to be just part of an organization. It's an organism. There's a family. It's not just an institution. It's not a club. It's not even a building. It's part of something that God is doing, and you're with other believers. In fact, to be a Christian and to not be in a church family is to be an orphan. And in fact, you don't really see it in the New Testament. You, whenever they talk about Christians, you see them tied in to their church family, to a church. And so I know in our current culture, super independent, somewhat skeptical, there's a tendency for people to just think they're just going to go it alone. That is not biblical. It's not in the New Testament. It's not, it's not God's best for you, for sure. It says, in Christ... We who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. So, I don't know if you ever thought of it that way, but you actually belong, you're property of, not just God, but his body. There's, you know, in the New Testament, there's not floating Christians. You know, it's not like somebody went to the church of Philippi one, one Sunday and then the next Sunday, they, you know, you know what, we're just going to try the church of Ephesus. You know, and then the next Sunday, we're just going to try the church of Corinth. No, they belonged. They were part of that. In fact, if they were going to move, they brought with them letters of recommendation from their church. Hey, this is how we were serving. This is how we were faithful. This is how God used us. So you don't see like lone, lone ranger Christians, you know, in the New Testament, which is actually real common today. There's people... There's lots of people where they're, they're not connected in. They're, they're, they don't have that sense of family. They're spectators. Uh, they're not participators. God wants you to come out of the grandstands and get onto the playing field and be an active participant of what he's doing in, in the world today. In fact, that's really the purpose of the church. Let's look at the four purposes of the church. The first one is, is it helps me stay spiritually motivated. Now, we're in a long-distance race as Christ followers, and so how do you stay motivated week after week, month after month, year after year, and we have opposition? There's things that come against us. There's challenges in the world. There's difficulties. Well, we do it. The church, is that's part of the church. It says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. It said, let us encourage one another. We all need encouragement. You, you need encouragement, particularly when you're going through discouraging times. And we can encourage one another. You know, if, if you take like a fire that has like, you know, coals, that's the easiest description, but it's true with logs too, but like those briskets, those coals, you take a little brisket out that, and it's all glowing. What happens to that solo brisket? It cools off, right? Then you put it back in, all of a sudden it starts glowing. It doesn't take long. And that's what it is to be a Christ follower in the church. When we come in, we, we get warmed up, and we warm up 
others. It says, have fellowship with one another. Greet one another, love one another, accept one another, be devoted, be kind, be compassionate. These are all the things that are describing what it means to encourage one another, to warm up one another. Bible says, share each other's troubles and problems and so obey the Lord's command. See, God wants us to be connected into his body. It's an important part of what it means to be a Christ follower. Number two is it helps me to develop spiritual maturity. God wants you and I to grow. He doesn't want us to plateau. You know, I've been serving the Lord for quite a while. Uh, since I came to Christ at 18, uh, had a rocky start. So around 2021, 20, I started getting serious with Jesus. And, and, and since then, I've, I've been, I try to read the Bible. I try to pray. I try to get, you know, fired up for the Lord. But, and so somebody could argue, make the argument that I could coast. Andy, you've been doing this so long, you could actually coast now. But the problem is there is no coasting. That is an illusion. You're either going up or you're going down. Those are, those are my options, and I don't want to go down. That's, I work too hard to get where I'm at. And so, I, but I can't do it on my own. I need other people to encourage me. That's how we grow. Look at the four key areas where we grow with the church. They, they were baptized. That's important. If you've not been baptized, uh, you should be, that, that's probably your next step is to get baptized. And join the other believers in regular attendance of the apostles' teaching that's coming in the big assembly like you're doing now. They worship together. That's obviously an important part. Regularly in the temple and met in small groups in their homes for communion. So coming to, if you want to be in a different place at the end of 2022, going into 2023, you're going to have to do something to make that happen. It's not just automatic. And so, what? Are, well, here's, here's a good, good starting place. If you've not been baptized, you get baptized. Make a commitment, regular attendance. Not only that, you decide to come on time and worship. Say, I'm going to participate in worship, and also I'm going to be in a small group. You heard earlier, uh, our small group ministry launches this week, and uh, we have our signups online. We would love to get you involved because we think it's so important. You see, a genuine, authentic New Testament Christian was involved in these four things. Third is it helps me discover my ministry. See, we were all born with an innate desire to make a difference, to have a life that is worthwhile. Not, I mean, the, the, if you follow the course of our culture in the world, you could easily get sucked into just living for yourself. You know, just live for yourself. Make as much as you can, go on big vacations, store, you know, pile, make your stockpile as big as you can. And we can get sucked into a, a life thinking that's what brings fulfillment, and it does not. So what brings fulfillment? Well, if you want to answer the question, does my life matter? It ultimately will come to, are you helping others? It's not about helping yourself. But that's our, that's, and so it, it becomes a little bit of a challenge because our, our, our natural gravitational pull is look out for number one. I got to take care of me, take care of my own, take care of, you know, and, but that you'll never find, especially as a Christ follower, you'll never find real significance that your life matters because honestly, it doesn't. If you're living for yourself, you're living below what God has for you. We're supposed to live and serve others. He says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Did you know God planned in advance before you were born the gifts he was going to give you, the abilities, and those match up to your purpose. He gives you certain gifts because he wants to, you to use those to serve others. Look at what this verse says. It says, God has given each of you some special abilities. He prepared those in advance. What are you supposed, how are you supposed to use them? Be sure to use them to get promoted at work. Be sure to use them to accumulate as much as you can. You know, just live a life of abundance. Use up as many resources as you can and retire and die. No, he had something different planned. 
He says, no, use them to help each other. And so that is called your ministry. Your ministry is birthed out of the gifts and the abilities he's given you and how you serve others. That's your ministry. How do I discover my ministry? Well, that's one of the purposes of the church. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service. That's the same word there for, for ministry. For, that's your ministry. He's, my job, my, my job description is not just to preach sermons and to do counseling and to do leadership training. My, my primary job description is right here. His pastors is to equip his people, that's you, so that you can make a difference in, in, in this world. You can discover your gifts and you can deploy those and serve others for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That's why we do our growth track. Growth track, this is step one, great time to step into growth tracks. Step one, step two, step three, step four, we do one each month. The first Sunday of every month, we always start out with step one. And it, for you to get involved and say, hey, I, I want to discover my gifts. I want to make a difference. I want to live with a sense of purpose. Purpose comes from service. And so, therefore, self-esteem comes from service. Mo many people are looking for self-esteem in if I, get, if I have enough money, if I have enough titles, enough status, enough success symbols, what I drive, where I can brag about where I go to vacation, if I have a boat, if I have two boats, if I have three boats. I know people like that. You probably do too. We all struggle with that. We try to, if I can you know, have enough status symbols around me, maybe I'll start to feel better about myself. That's not where self, I don't think Mother Teresa struggled with self-esteem. And she gave her life away. You, when you know your life matters for something, you will have a strong self-esteem. Look at what the Bible says here. There are different kinds of service to God, but it is the same Lord we are serving all of you together are one body of Christ, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. This would be my heart for you this morning, is that you would, you would understand that you are a necessary part of what God is doing. You're not extraneous. You're not expendable. You are vital. You are necessary. Have you ever done a jigsaw puzzle and then it turns out you get to the end and somebody like lost of one of the pieces who had done it before you? That's pretty irritating, right? And then if you leave it up, what's the first thing you look at? The, the missing piece. It might be great. It could be a 500,000 piece puzzle. Doesn't matter. You go right to the piece that's missing. Like, dang, I can't enjoy this puzzle. Missing a piece. If you're supposed to be involved if you're a christ follower you are supposed to be involved and so you play an important role could you could you imagine with your own body because the, the the church is the body of christ could you imagine in your own body if like one of your organs didn't want to play like you know the liver says i don't think i'll i'll pass i'm just gonna watch I'll be here, but I don't count on me to do anything. That sounds like a lot of work, the way you're eating and drinking. <laughs> I'll pass on that. Or your liver decides to be a floating liver. Like, yeah, I want to try. Yeah, that body looks like it's, you know, it's doing really good. I'll go over there. No, actually, they have a liver. You're supposed to be in a body. And so part of your, your, your uh, prayerful purpose is God. Where am I supposed to serve so that I can be my, that necessary part? I'm not going to just be an attender. I'm going to get involved. And it helps me to, dis the church can help me discover my ministry. And then number four, it helps me to fulfill my mission. You have a cause you're supposed to li be living for. Now, if outside of Christ, people just start grasping, trying to find something worthy of living for. 
And so, you know, for some people it's sports, some people it's decorating their home, some people it's liberating animals. I mean, you, you know, nothing wrong with hobbies and different things, but that shouldn't be your purpose. As a Christ follower, you have a purpose, a mission in life. What is that? Well, the Bible is actually very clear about it in many places. Here's one. Life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about God's kindness and love. That's a critical part that everybody here, if you're a Christ follower, we share in common. We have a common mission to share the good news of Christ to other people. It's, 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 it's a central part of what we're supposed to do. You see, when you come to Christ, everything is better in heaven. And when you come to Christ, you get to go to heaven. Why doesn't God just ship you off to heaven right away? I mean, you can do everything there. You can worship there. You can fellowship. You can have fun. I mean, heaven is amazing. And yet you stay here. Why? Well, there's two things that you can do here that you can't do in heaven. One is you can share your faith about Christ. You can do that here. You can't do that there because everybody knows Christ. Two, that something you can do here that you can't do in heaven is you can sin. So, so which one do you think he left you here to do? Share your faith about Christ or to sin? Some of you were wondering, I don't know. Uh, give me a, I don't know, it sounds like, sounds like a challenge, you know. Well, it is kind of a challenge, but obviously it's not to sin. Now, we will sin, but it does, that's not the reason he leaves us here. So a central part of our mission when we become Christ followers is to be, the Bible talks about it as being an ambassador, Christ's ambassador. And that's the fourth purpose of the church, to help you discover your mission, help you fulfill that by helping you to share your faith, training you, helping, helping you grow in that understanding of who you are in Christ so that you can share that effectively and also providing a church where you can invite people. Many, many people come here by invitation and then end up coming to Christ. And so we're part of a team. It's a partnership. And so this is an important part. So these are the four purposes of the church. How do you choose a church family? How do you choose the right church? You don't want to just join a church and then find out, you know, months or even years later, this wasn't the right church for me. Well, here's one of the things you need to do is look at their statement of faith. State, now, we talk about our beliefs in Growth Track. We also have it up on uh, our website. You can go there. It's about the, kind of the uh, before you visit, I think, on, on that link. And so you want to ask this question. Do they accept the Bible as God's complete word? Do they accept the Bible as God's authoritative word? This is important because... Not everybody does. You know, they, some people say, yeah, we believe in the Bible plus this little book. You know, we have an extra book that's equal to that. You know, or they have, you know, yeah, we believe in the Bible plus all our denominational traditions. Those are all the, you know, no, that's, that's a problem. Nothing wrong with having some traditions in your life, but it's the Bible. The Bible is the authoritative word of God in my life. So that's one. Number two is, is its style of worship. Obviously, that's important. You know, music is so varied. It's, I mean, it's, they can, um, people that do marketing for like, you know, the radio and for Sirius X, you know, they, they have all of these, hey, we, can, we know the exact kind of group that listens to this kind of music. And so that can be a challenge, actually, in a church because we have so many different types of people, especially in our church. Our church, we've, tr we've attempted over the years to be uh, multi-generational, multi-racial, multicultural. And so one of the challenges is music. And so does the worship style help me feel God's presence? So that's our goal. We talk to the worship team. Hey, our primary goal is if, if, God, if we don't sense God's presence, it doesn't matter if we hit all of our notes or the timing was perfect. It doesn't matter. Is all our high our our goal is is did people experience Christ in that? Did they sense the presence of God? 
Now, it's interesting when Jesus is talking about worship, he says those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. So those are the only two things that are required, spirit and in truth. As far as style, God doesn't care. And so you have some people, they, they, they love hymns. Some people, I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of worship, right? There's worship where, you know, if, for some people it feels like total chaos. You know, other, you know, there's other worship styles where it feels like, you know, you're, you're, you're scared to death. Or the frozen chosen. I mean, you know, all kinds of, of types of worship. So you just got to find one that resonates with you. Now, for here at Vineyard, we part of our mission is, is that we're relevant. We're contemporary. And so we look for worship that reflects that. It, we look for contemporary worship. We look for a feel that is, uh, that, again, contemporary you know, R&B, some indie. I mean, those are some of the, the things we're look, that, that we look at. And lyrics are important. The, when they choose a new worship song, they always run it by me because I want to look. I don't even listen to the song. I just look at the lyrics. I want to make sure the lyrics look like they're rooted in Scripture. I don't want just feel-good lyrics. And so good worship will charge your spiritual battery. Now, one of the things that you need to think about is is once you join a church don't try to change the worship after that sometimes they you know yeah you know oh this church would be great if we only did this kind of music you know i mean uh and now if you're a musician that might happen but if not uh you know this is what this this is who we are so uh number three is is it strategy that's obviously important again in growth track that's where we talk about our vision our goals or objectives. We think that's important. We think that, I mean, you wouldn't just get on a plane or get on a bus without knowing that where it's going, right? You know, just, you're not going to just say, well, any, anywhere is fine. No, you're, you're going somewhere. And so when you uh, get involved in a church, you want to know where are they going? And that's why we talk about uh, our vision, our mission, our strategy in, uh, in, in, in particularly in step one, we talk about. Did I mention that step one's today? Okay. <laughs> So right after the service, we'll feed you, watch your kids. We'd love to have you in there. Uh, and you ask, does it take the Great Commission? Seriously, that's obviously part of that because we just looked at that. That's the mission of the church. That's your mission is to share the love of Christ with other people. Here's what Jesus said about it. He said, therefore, go. He's talking to Christ followers. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So that's part of that. And we want to equip you for that, but we also believe in that. And also ask, does it embrace all nationalities and ethnicities? Now, that would be a question. I might be a little biased there because I know that, uh, that there's plenty of churches that do, not, that do not have that as a value. I personally think it is important because... Uh, our view of, of the kingdom of God is that in heaven, you know, there's all healing, there's all nationalities. The things that Jesus said that when we pray, he said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying kingdom, kingdom, what, what's happening in heaven, we're praying that into the earth. That's why we pray for physical healing. That's why we pray for restored marriages and people being freed from addictions and all kinds of stuff. And so when we look at heaven, which you have all nationalities, we believe that the church should reflect that. When somebody comes into the church, they should see a little piece of heaven. It's not perfect, but they should get some sense of this is what heaven is like. In heaven, there's people are healed. In heaven, people are restored. They love one another. And so to me, that's an important question. Uh, then number four is, is it structure? Uh, that a structure is important. Uh, and so churches have a structure to them. By law, there's a certain structure to a church. They have bylaws. They have, uh, you know, systems that they operate with. So the key question is, is there a sense of freedom in the structure? You see, in some churches, the structure is so limiting, so difficult, there's so much bureaucracy that it could take somebody months or years to get involved. For us, the minute you become, minute you go through growth track, you're, we're ready to, hey, however you want to be used. How, how, how's God wired you? We want to, 
we, we don't want there to be lots of red tape. We don't think that that's the best way to do it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So there should be the freedom, freedom of expression, freedom to, to, to use your gifts as God, as God, as God designed you to, to, to do that. And so the question is, is, will this church allow me to get involved in a ministry? Or do I get bogged down in tradition and bureaucracies and political maneuvering and all those kinds of things? No. For us, you join today, you're involved tomorrow. And then secondly, does it have small groups where I can learn to relate to other believers? Where I can learn to relate to other believers? As I said, the church is a body. It's not a business. It's a family. And so we need to grow to one another, grow with one another. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, I'm just part of the invisible body. Or you, if you get sick, are you going to be visited by the invisible pastor? You know, <laughs> Casper the ghost or something? No, no, it needs to be tangible. Let's be real. This, there's people here. We represent the body of Christ. And everybody is, has, is necessary. It's a separate necessary part. Three reasons to commit to a church. Number one is, is it does build my character. See, God uses commitment to build us up so that we grow. We grow in the fruit of the Spirit, which is another term for character. And, in, in, you know, in, in America particularly, we have a hard time being committed. There's a lot of people that have a hard time being committed to a marriage, being committed to America, you know, being com committed to first responders. I mean, it's a challenge. We, we find all kinds of reasons or, and being committed to the church family. Look at what the Bible talks about when it says commitment. It says, the Lord laid before his people the following conditions to test their commitment to him. And so there is something that happens when you make a commitment. Say, hey, I'm in. I'm in. You can count on me. I'm going to be a necessary part of what's happening. Number two is it deepens my relationships. Again, there's plenty of people that live together even Christ followers that will live together, but they don't want to get married. They go, ah, it's just a piece of paper. What does that mean? Well, the piece of paper represents something significant. It says that I'm committed. I, you can count on me. I'll be here. Uh, it, it, of course, it doesn't, doesn't mean we don't renege on that, but it's a form of commitment, and God honors commitments. God honors commitments. He says you should be like one big happy family, loving one another with tender hearts. And then thirdly, it makes me like Christ. Christ is committed to the church. What's God up to in the world? He's changing the world. He's redeeming the world through the church. The Bible says Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He's highly committed to the church. That's why he calls it the body of Christ. He says Jesus is the head. We are the body can't separate the two i mean there could i mean that'd be weird right if i said about if i told sharon i said you know i love you but i reject your body that wouldn't do too well right to do that to 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 somebody you care about oh, i love you it's just your body i can't stand that's a problem and so it's true with the church jesus would feel the same way about it as, so, as somebody who said that about you because he loves the church, and that's what he's all about. He goes, I will build my church. He's developing us in spiritual maturity. He wants us to live a life of meaning and significance, fulfilling our mission, and we do that together through the church. Let's bow our heads and pray. All right, well, if you're online, just would you take a moment and just, this is, I always think this is the most important part of the whole service. Your moment to talk to God, to draw near to him, maybe resolve some things. Maybe come home spiritually and say, God, I'm, I need to come home. Maybe it's coming home to a church. Maybe it's coming home to God. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that your presence would be here. I trust, Lord, that you, I know you're drawing people to you, and I just put them in your hands right now. Lord, I pray that you would make our church, Vineyard Church, a place that's caring, 
compassionate, that's loving, that's friendly, that's warm, people that take care of one another, help each other to grow, to prosper. Lord, I pray that everyone who has gifts here, especially if those gifts have died away, somebody's kind of let them dim for different reasons, maybe it's clouded by confusion or sin, Lord, that you would fan those flames, make them hot again for you. Lord, give this church a burning passion, even if it means reprioritizing our schedule so that we can put you first and put your body first. You've never made a decision for Christ or you find yourself this morning far from God. I want to invite you to make a decision, to make a commitment to God. Say, God, I want to, I want to get right with you. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, if God's speaking to you and you're saying, yes, include me, I want to pray, I want to ask God to come into my life, to forgive me, to give me a fresh start, then I want to lead you in that prayer right now. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or stand up, but what I am going to ask you to do, right where you're at, just to let me know. Say, Andy, I want to follow you in that prayer. I want to pray to ask God into my life to give me a fresh start. I want to come home to Christ. I want to come home to God. If that's you and you want to follow me in that prayer, just let me know by boldly just putting your hand up. Just say, yep, bless you. Okay? Yeah, I see hands up. Bless you all over in the back. I see you. Anybody else? Just keep your hand up just for a second. There you go. Anybody else? Okay, put your hand down. Pray, pray this prayer with me. Say, today's my day, God. I want to come home to you. I need a fresh start in my life. You say, God, forgive me for trying to do things myself in my own strength. Give me fresh vision. Give me a fresh start. And would you say, Holy Spirit, come and rebirth something in me. Give me hope. Give me fresh dreams. Rekindle the gifts inside me. You say, God, I want to use my gifts to make a difference, which means serving others and in ministry to build up the church. Thank you, God. Lord, I, would you say, God, help me to find a church family that I can belong to, I can be a necessary part of, and where I can use my gifts to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen.